Um, so I'm Abby Hardy Moss. I am Director of Conservation Technology and Planning Division at Greenbelt. I've been here for about 12 years. And what I do here is I'm in charge of all of the GIS and database, particularly having to do with land um, work that we do. And that includes everything from, you know, day-to-day -day boundary, data editing, um, analysis, interactive web maps and products, and um, our Trails app, Green Belt Go. So um, I'm here with Laura Matei, who's the Director of Stewardship for SVT, and we are talking about project selection and prioritization. Um, we're going to start off by talking about a number of the key GIS data sources that um, you want to be using in land conservation projects in Massachusetts. We're going to also look at data viewers and analysis tools. Um, I'm going to touch briefly on a um, analysis project that Greenbelt did, and Laura also has one she's going to mention. And then we're going to wrap up with Laura talking about um, kind of site visits, how to prepare for them, and how to get out and actually do that project review on the land. Um, so moving on a little bit about Greenbelt, um, we are a regional land trust serving the 34 cities and towns of Essex County, which is in the northeastern quadrant of Massachusetts. We've been a land trust for over 60 years. Um, we've protected over 19,000 acres in that time. And while we have hundreds of properties and almost 300 conservation restrictions, we have about 50 public properties that the public um, can easily access. We, our mission is that we protect land for habitat, agriculture, and scenic value. And Laura, do you wanna jump in about SVT? Yeah, and I'll also just let you know a little bit about me. I'm Laura Matei, I'm the Director of Stewardship with Sudbury Valley Trustees. I've been with SVT for uh, 22 years, it's a long time. Um, and so I do have a lot of experience with land management uh, and I also have um, spent a lot of time working with our land protection staff on uh, prioritization and evaluating sites. Uh, a little bit about SVT. We protect natural areas for wildlife and people in a 36 community region between Boston and Worcester. We've been in business for 70 years working on land protection, stewardship, and engaging people with nature. We now have 94 properties in 19 communities. That Those are the ones we own, 2,480 acres. We hold 97 CRs in 23 communities for over 3,000 acres. That's SVP. Two things that I forgot to mention is that when I first came to Greenbelt 12 years ago, I actually started in the conservation. Well, I'm, uh, my division sits within the conservation department, but I actually started working on projects in the conservation department. And I spent a number of years doing that kind of work. I still work on projects, but I'm a little more, you know, work for the entire organization now. Um, before I came to Greenbelt, I actually worked for a municipality down on the South Shore. So I've experienced what all of you municipal folks um, see day to day. Um, so that's kind of my background. Um, so jumping into GIS data, um, one of the key kind of perspectives to take kind of the broad view when you're thinking about using GIS data to evaluate a project is tying the mission of whatever the organization or group is that you're looking at from the perspective of to the data, right? So you know, what is the core mission? Are you out to protect habitat? Are you out to protect farmland? Um, you know, are you really, really interested in salt marshes? This photograph is an aerial photo of our headquarters, which is also the great marsh there. Um, you know, and then once you've kind of identified your goal as it's tied to your mission, then asking these questions that I'm listing here, and you're gonna see some of these questions come up time and again what's available, and that's a really key limitation. Um, we are very, very lucky in Massachusetts. There's probably, you know, we are very data rich in Massachusetts, but there's not always the data available. Um, this presentation today is focused primarily on either non-GIS users or kind of like relatively new GIS users. Um, if folks are interested in kind of a more in-depth view, we do touch on that, and you're welcome to contact me, and I'm always happy to talk about that more with people. But, um, you know, we at Greenbelt generally will create data if we if it's not available, but even we can't always even do that with a, you know, GIS division here. So that's going to be a really key thing, what's available. 
You also want to look at questions like, how was it developed? What were, like, was there field data being collected by scientists or not? Was it done from aerial photos? How old is it? Um, what was the intention of the data? Was it meant to be used at the scale of a parcel or a town or multi-towns or sometimes even an entire region of New England? Whether the way you answer those questions tells you whether or not that data is appropriate to be used in the situation you're in. Some data is just not appropriate to be used at a parcel level um, or vice versa. It's not appropriate to be used at a regional level. So that's kind of a broad perspective to be using when you're thinking about both part, just looking at a parcel and looking at GIS data, as well as kind of taking it to the next step and doing a prioritization. So I'm gonna just run through some data types and sources. All of these blue underlined um, items are hyperlinks and I'm gonna send this to Barbara as a PDF and those will continue to work. So these links will take you to um, you know, the, the background data, the information on these data sources, or in some cases, the data viewers that I'm talking about. Um, parcel data, I eat, breathe, and sleep the parcel data. It's maybe not the most exciting data set out there, but it is, you know, potentially one of the most powerful. We built an entire database off of the parcel data for Massachusetts, um, and it is very rich with metadata in it or attribute data. Um, this data is publicly available and regularly updated for the state of Massachusetts on a state level, which was not the case before the recent project, which started about 10 years ago. So the quality and consistency is uh, consistent across towns, which um, I can't say how important that is for regional uh, organizations, but it includes all this really important information, landowners, key, key information, parcel ID, recording information, it's not always filled in, but if it's there, you can pull the deed at your registry. I use that all the time. Sometimes they'll also have survey recording information, which just is very, very handy and saves you a ton of time. That would be the last recorded information, so the last recorded deed or the last recorded survey. Doesn't mean that a survey doesn't exist if you don't see it in there, but if it's in there, it's really handy. Assessment value and sale value. So assessments are not always accurate for parcels but it can give you a starting place to the value of that parcel. Um, if there are buildings on the property, it will give you the types of and ages of the buildings. Um, I say some easements and restrictions because that is a sub data layer. It's not complete by any stretch, but it can give you a sense. Um, and then land use, I have italicized because unfortunately, at least as far as I can find, that's not available in the public data viewers, but if you download the GIS data, and use it in GIS, there is a table that you can join that has the land use. We really heavily use that. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that when I talk about farmland data. So I will come back to that. I have that italicized just because that's not a publicly available necessarily. Um, another foundational data set in the state of Massachusetts is the Mass GIS um, protected and recreational open space layer. That's what's shown here. Um, the most important thing I will say about this that I see a lot of people confused about this data is that it's not all protected. And so that's why I showed it the way I did here. The dark green is permanently protected, but then the red and orange and light green are limited protection, no protection or term limited protection. So it's really important when you use this data that you look at that, either you view it this way, which is showing the level of protection, or you look at the attributes and I'll show you all how to do this um, and see there's a field called level protection. Find out how protected is it because sometimes you might get like a golf course and it has no protection at all. So you have to be careful about that. Um, but this is a very powerful data set as well. We use this all the time. Um, it has the primary purpose of the property, whether or not there's public access, which is really handy, article 97, all sorts of really, really useful information. Um, habitat data. So I am going through these pretty quickly. It's a ton of data to kind of talk about and I want to get to the, um, the portion of the, the presentation where I'm going to demo the data tools and things like that. Um, but if you have questions, put them in the chat. Uh, my email is going to be at the end. You can always ask me questions if you have them after you explore the links. Um, one thing I should say is that in, you know, now that we're getting into kind of these categories of data, there's, I'm sure, more data in all of these categories, um, some more than others, but I just listed kind of 
some of the most commonly or key data sets I use, and then also some of the newer ones that maybe have come out. So in Habitat, first and foremost would be Biomap. Um, that is a combined project of Mass Wildlife and the Nature Conservancy. We were using Biomap 2 for probably about a decade, and then the new Biomap was just released in the last six months. That's what the link shows there. Um, this is one of the most widely used data sets in Massachusetts to evaluate habitat. It's a huge comprehensive project. There's a ton of information online about it. One thing that's really important about Biomap is that it's often a requirement of state grant funding for conservation projects. So when you're filling out or someone's filling out that state grant application, particularly for like a conservation partnership grant or a land grant for a municipality, they're gonna ask, is this parcel or property, does, is there buy amount um, there? And there's plenty of ways to view that, including on one of the data viewers I'm gonna show you. Um, priority and estimated habitat, that's essentially habitats for rare species that is developed and maintained by Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. This is an important data set because it's a regulatory. So if a construction project, a proposed project falls within a mapped um, priority or estimated habitat, it has to go through a review for natural, through natural heritage. That is not true for Biomap. Um, so that's kind of a key thing to know about with priority and estimated habitat. Um, that is also true for certified vernal pools in the next item, also maintained by natural heritage. Those would be vernal pools that a person has gone out and done field data collection and filled out a form to certify that a pool is actually kind of a, a site of productive um, breeding habitat. Um, potential pools are just that. They are not regulatory. They're just identified as pools that could be vernal pools. Um, natural communities, um, maps, kind of uh, important habitat natural areas um, throughout the state. Um, areas of critical environmental concern, also regulatory. Um, those are areas, the Great Marsh is actually a great example of that. Certain areas that have been identified as just, it kind of is what it sounds like, extremely important habitat areas. Um, those are also regulatory. They can be a little bit spotty in terms of the distribution. Um, I could say more about that, but that's kind of a whole nother conversation for another day. Um, also wetlands and hydrography. Hydrography is really just rivers and streams and kind of um, polygons around that. That's almost a core data set. We probably have that data on in nearly every map we make, but it can also be certainly habitat as well. Um, relatively self-explanatory. I will show you that data when we do our demo. And then briefly, um, particularly, so UMass CAPS, the Conservation Assessment and Prioritization System, um, pr pretty much every one of these data layers you could do an hour or more of reading on. That's a fascinating project out of UMass Amherst. Um, it was a huge collaborative project where a large group of people, scientists, specialists, worked together to develop this system to assess areas of important habitat. Um, that You can download that data, and there is, on, if you click this link, there are PDFs of every town on their website of maps. So you can, if you, you know, work in a town or multi-town area, you can download those, you can print them out. Um, I will look again, I do not think there's a data viewer, but you can download the data and use it in your GIS system. Um, and then resilient land, I'm, there's a tool for that from the Nature Conservancy. I will show you all that and I'll talk more about that. That is really a core data set for us both in terms of habitat and climate. Um, and then eBird, I, again, I'll talk a little bit more about resilient land because that's a big project, but later. Um, eBird is a newer data set from Cornell Ornithology Lab. It's really, really interesting. You can download that data. There's a data viewer and it maps different types of habitat, generally for birds. And then also they interestingly map specific species um, distribution and habitats. That we're just kind of getting into using, but. It's a really interesting data set and I think it's gonna be really helpful moving forward. Um, okay, so farmland. This is a key area in addition to habitat, farmland is a major focus for us. Um, I tried here to really focus on kind of the most common areas that land trusts focus on in the state, but there's always more that you could probably do. Um, so I would say the three core data sets that we really use are the first three that I list. Farm soils, parcel data, and land cover and land use. Farm soils is a subset of a larger NRCS soil data layer. 
The good news is, is that in the state's data viewer mass mapper, they do allow you to see it as farm soils, which is really, really important because farm soils are really important to farmers. That's what we found in working with farmers. But very importantly, they can be um, a requirement of certain grant programs and they are a requirement uh, under the APR program, certain kind of amounts of or percentages of farm soils. Um, I will also show you those in Mass Mapper. This image is, um, this is a Greenbelt farm, a farm that we own and that um, a farm leases from us. And these are uh, farm, farm land, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but here of statewide importance, I believe. We'll take a look at that. Um, Parcel data, so I mentioned this before. This is a really, really helpful way to identify farms. Um, in the parcel data, in that land use table that I was mentioning before, the um, land use of a farm or agriculture, there's a number of different categories that are identified as farmland. And also chapter 61 status is often identified in parcels. We've done a project where we've contacted every town in our region and actually from their assessor's office gotten all of the lists of the chapter 61 parcels, 61, well, all 61, but 61A is the preferential tax program specifically for agricultural properties. And what we've found when we've compared those lists against the state's data is that most of the farm parcels are in the uh, parcel data, but not all of them. But still, if you don't have anything else, it's quite good. Um, but you do need to be able to access that land use table, which you can do, as I mentioned before, in GIS. Um, that's why that's italicized. The land cover and land use data, um, that data, I'll show that to you in a couple minutes, that has a couple categories of agriculture land use, um, and I believe it says cultivated and hay, so we'll see that. Farmers markets, that can just be an interesting, um, you know, interesting data source for you to use, locations of farmers markets. And then Farms Under Threat is a really interesting new project by the American Farmland Trust. Um, we, we, so I say by permission because we had to contact them to get the data, but you can do that and um, they will send you the data for download. But there is a really nice data viewer, which you can access via that link that I have there. And what they do there is they project potential farmland loss over time, and you can run different scenarios in your region. I'm not gonna demo that for you all today, um, but it's very user-friendly and you can kind of say, okay, I wanna look at it as business as usual or you know, a more severe development threat. And you can choose, you can click like a county, I believe it's a county or a state, and you can get statistics for that region based on different development scenarios. So really interesting set of tools that AFT is um, developing and has released recently. I believe that was in the last year. Okay, so I believe I just have one, two more of these, and then I'm, we're going to get into a demo. So I promise you'll have a little break just from the incessant talking. Um, okay, so climate data, there's tons and tons of climate data out there but I tried to focus on the core data sets that we really use. Um, sea level rise, really critical data. Um, we are focusing more and more on climate and we work in close partnership with municipalities. And these are just areas that folks are more increasingly focusing on. We are located on the coast. And so, you know, more than half of our communities are coastal communities and they are seeing the impacts of flooding particularly um, although also some uh, wildfires and heat. So um, when we work with towns, we really ha have to be talking about climate and it is kind of a mission critical um, perspective that we are taking as well. So sea level rise, that's developed by NOAA, downloadable, viewable in MassGIS. The hurricane surge inundation zones, that is what you see here. Um, so those are areas where during a storm, a hurricane surge is most likely to kind of hit those coastal areas during a coastal storm. And then I have some more, um, well, the Mass Coast Fliss Risk Flood Model was developed by the Woods Hole Group. That is a newer data set. It's actually been around for a number of years, but it hasn't been publicly available until more recently. We are just starting to use that data ourselves, but that is kind of the more sophisticated, bright and shiny new flood modeling um, that we are gonna be using going forward. And then I have the FEMA flood hazard data that is of course very standardly used in the flood maps. 
Um, we have used it in the past when we didn't have access to the Woods Hole group data, but also um, when working with municipalities, they often have to use FEMA data as kind of a, a standard, and it's often a data layer that people are just used to seeing, and it does provide inland flooding potential. Um, and then biomap, the reason I listed it here is, as well as in um, the habitat data is because there are subsets of the biomap data that's specifically focused around climate. And so that's really important to take a look at and that's something that you can do. Um, the SLAM data from CZM is new. Um, that is looking at sea level rise on marshes and the potential for marsh migration. Um, it's quite a complex data set, but they have a really great story map and data viewer about it. Um, it's really interesting data. And I would say it's kind of the next level of if you're really into climate change, you might want to dive into that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's new and it's really interesting data. And then finally, resilient land. I'm going to show that's the, the tool I mentioned before. That's a really core data set from the Nature Conservancy on the resiliency of both terrestrial and coastal habitats. Um, and that's another one like Biomap that is often a requirement in grant applications to say whether or not a property is in uh, the Nature Conservancy re resilient land. Um, okay, and so drinking water is my last one. Um, I'm gonna just kind of pause here to say, when I first started at Greenbelt, we didn't look at drinking water really. Um, we looked at some information around it, but we never, we had done a prioritization analysis in 2011. We did not do a drinking water analysis. Um, we would include data if we knew that a property was kind of in a, like a zone A or zone B, something like that. But it was something that we glancingly, I would say, you know, it was a side thing that we looked at. Now it is such a huge topic of conversation and so vitally important to municipalities that it's become very clear to us over the last five to 10 years that it, it, like climate, if we're not talking about drinking water, we're really missing out. And so I'll talk more about this, but in our newer prioritization, we had a whole analysis focused on drinking water. Um, and we now routinely are looking at these data layers when we're looking at parcels. Um, because this data is critically important to municipalities and it's critically important to, frankly, a wider set of people than, you know, might be interested in a parcel just for habitat, for example. So these are the data layers. I'm going to spend a little less time on this today, but, um, you know, definitely take a look at them. They're largely focused around regulatory distinctions around public drinking water supplies. So kind of a more human-based perspective, like some of the climate um, perspectives. Um, around land conservation. Okay, so let's dive into Mass Mapper. So this is the link that you all can use as well. Um, please jump in and someone say something if you guys cannot see Mass Mapper, um, because I can, so I'm assuming you all can. So this is the tool, this is MassGIS, the state of Massachusetts um, data viewer. Any of those data sources, uh, generally speaking, that I listed under MassGIS, you will see them here. And these are the different um, kind of categories. Um, they allow you to change the base map here. Abby, so you, yes. Excuse me. Um, some people cannot see the mapper. Okay. Uh, maybe I will stop sharing and share again. Does that sound good? Oh, hold on. I think I just figured it out. Thank you. Can. If you couldn't see it before, please say if you can see it now. Yeah, we can see it now. Yeah. Great. OK, good. Um, OK, so let me just show you that again. So the data sources are here on the right. These are all kind of folders that you can look at here. And I'll show you that in a moment. But some of the basic tools here. So you can change the base map. This is the MassGIS base map. You can look at aerial photographs. Um, you can look at the USGS topo. A plain gray base map I actually like if I have a lot of data. Um, but one thing I will tell you because I learned this the hard way myself. So this gray uh, base map and this one as well, the streets base map, these are Esri base maps and they limit how far you can zoom in. And so I had a data layer when I was playing around with this. I had a data layer in here that hat would not display at this scale and I couldn't zoom in any closer. So if you're finding that, and I'll show you what that looks like, it'll have a little exclamation point next to the data layer. 
just change what your data and see now all of a sudden I can zoom in more or your base map is what I should have said. Uh, other tools that I will show you as we kind of move through this, there's an info tool right here. So I can click on a parcel and all those data that I was mentioning for the parcels and I should just back up and say, the parcels are added by default. You can see them here. The bottom part of this uh, column is the data that you have in your map. And then up here are all the data you can add. It does add those parcels by default, but you can turn them on and off. So then if I click on this parcel, I can scroll through it and I can see its address, 266 North Street in Salem, Massachusetts. I can see that it is owned by the Catholic Cemetery, the Association of Catholic Cemeteries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I can see, so this would be some of the registration information. This is the book and page of the deed, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. I can see the buildings and on and on. So that's really handy information to have. I can also type in an address. I'm just going to put Greenbelt's headquarters here because this is of Essex, Mass. So it shows me that is actually where I'm sitting right now. So this is where we are. So you can type it in and it's actually giving you um, the, big, the parcel, the lot numbers here. Or no, actually 82, it's giving you the address. You can change that. I'll show you that in a moment. So you can scroll through this and you can see Essex County Greenbelt is the owner, etc. Okay. So I'm going to add some of those data that I was showing you all. And I'm going to show you where most of the data that you're going to be interested is in. I would really recommend, before I go too far into this, what I would really recommend for people who are interested in this is open it up and just spend time. Click around, play with it. You cannot break it. It's really wonderful that way. And the way you're going to get comfortable with it is just doing that. And I've taught a number of people how to use this, and I always say that. Um, but with that said, there it can be a lot of folders in here. So I always try to kind of tell people where to look. The biggest place you wanna look is this conservation and recreation folder. That's where most of the data is gonna be, although there are some exceptions. Um, you can see right off the bat, you have areas of critical environmental concern. I'm gonna throw that in there. Um, so I just click on an item and you can see it added it in. This is the Great Marsh critical um, ACEC. Um, one, you'll notice here when I clicked on the Great Marsh, it actually allows me to view the information from the parcel or the ACEC. So I can choose because when I clicked, I clicked on both the parcel and the ACEC. So you can choose which one you want to look at here. And then if I want to get rid of this, I just click this little trash can. If I want to change the way it looks, there's not a lot you can do here, but you can make it completely transparent or you can, whatever their default, kind of how opaque it is, you can make it more and less. I can also change the color. However, and you'll find this in a lot of places, um, I'll show that this will make more sense when you see it, but if there's multiple categories within a data layer, it will set that one color to all of them. So that's not always helpful. Let's say I don't love this yellow, it doesn't look great. I can say clear custom color and it'll set it, it'll change it back. So I'm just gonna clear this and I'm gonna open up some of these other data layers. So under natural heritage, so it's natural heritage and endangered species program, we have biomap, and then you have lots of kind of options here. So um, core, so if you want to just look at the two basic elements of biomap, that would be core habitat and critical natural landscapes. Now I accidentally put core habitat underneath critical natural landscapes, so I can just click that and put it back on top because if you put it underneath, they're not always overlapping, but sometimes they are. And so I couldn't see my core habitat. This for a lot of purposes, like from a project perspective for grant purposes, this might be all you need where you can look at it and you can say, okay, you know, is, is there core habitat on this parcel that I'm looking at? I actually wanna be able to see the parcels on top. So I just move that on top and now I can see, this is again, Greenbelt's headquarters. I can see how much uh, biomap to, or this is not biomap to, I have to get used to not saying that anymore, biomap core habitat and critical natural landscape there is. If I want to measure that, because a lot of times in grant applications, you do need to measure that, you can, you can measure length. This is this little, you know, measurement tool. Length or area, you're going to want area, you probably want acres. 
And then I can draw whatever my area is and it's measuring that for me, okay? So that's a really handy um, tool, particularly for grant applications or you know, even just for your internal review and knowing what the situation is. Um, all right, so that's Biomap. If you wanna get into a little more detail on Biomap, like let's say you're interested in the climate data layers that are associated with Biomap. These components, what these are, are the pieces of data that make up Biomap. And so this is the, um, oh wait, I'm sorry. I just told you the wrong thing. Let me point at the right thing. So biomap core habitat components. And I can choose which one I want to look at. And then also the critical natural landscape. So let's say I want to look at turn foraging habitat, which I actually just guessed, luckily for me, that is an area here um, at the Cox Reservation in Essex. Let's say I also, I'm sure we are wetland core buffer, um, but I was wrong. I'm surprised by that because this is a great marsh. Um, and I can add all of those different components that make up that core habitat and critical natural landscape. Um, the thing I accidentally pointed at here, these are new data that are really important and a big change from Biomap 2 to the new Biomap, which is the local data and the regional data. So the regional data, these are areas that are important on a regional scale. Um, let's see if we can find one change my base map. Okay, so here we have one and this is gonna be the Great Marsh again. And this is important both for regional connectivity and, oh no, I'm sorry, you can see feature found one. So it's important for rare species. Um, so that's important from a regional perspective. Um, I'm sorry, I keep reading it wrong. Yes, no, rare species, regional rare species. Um, something that's gonna be increasingly more important I think for um, towns and for local land trusts is the um, locally important areas. Um, and so that is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It is the um, opposite of regional uh, areas. And so that's these items here. And again, it's the same kind of idea where you can click these data and you can find out areas that are important from a local scale not generally appropriate if you're talking about a regional conservation priority, but from a local perspective, those are important. Okay, I'm gonna just show a couple more data here because we have a lot more to get through today. Um, but I wanted to point out in physical resources, a lot of the water-based data is in here as well as land use. Um, and so that land cover and land use data, that, oops, that's the wrong one. Uh, this one that I was mentioning, now you'll notice here that little exclamation point, it says zoom in closer to see this layer. So I'm gonna do that. We'll see if this was the one that wouldn't draw. So that is an example. It will not draw at this, oh, never mind. I can't remember which data layer was that wouldn't draw, but um, it was just loading. Once, it's, once it shows up, it gives me these categories. Now, this can be important for a number of uses, but if you are interested in agricultural or farmland conservation, you can see this cultivated and pasture or hay. You can also often determine that kind of information just from just looking at the aerial photographs, um, but that can be really handy as well to look at that um, land cover. Um, also wanted to point out the wetlands information and water. So here you have aquifers under physical resources. Um, a lot of people don't find it intuitive that rivers and streams are under hydrography, which is under physical resources. So keep that in mind, as well as the DEP wetlands, just working with and showing people this, they've been like, where? I can't find this information. So I wanted to point all of that out to you. Um, and then also regulated areas has some natural heritage data because there are those layers that I was mentioning are regulatory. And so those are not always under the, you know, they'd be, you could find them under this regulated areas as opposed to conservation recreation. So you have estimated and priority habitats. The final thing I'll mention here, just core data set, again, something I found people don't always find intuitive is um, political and administrative boundaries. That's where all your town boundaries and that kind of thing are. Um, okay, so I'm going to, uh, go back to my um, PowerPoint here and I'm opening up, okay, 
I think I've just switched my tab to the resilient land mapping tool. Can everybody see this tab? Yes. Yes, okay. So this is the Nature Conservancy's tool to look at their resilient land data. And this is what pops up when you get in there. And so I'm gonna click enter the tool and I'm gonna zoom into Massachusetts. Now, this is a really fascinating project um, that the Nature Conservancy has been working on for, they released it probably about 10 years ago. Um, and it was really kind of a groundbreaking project that looked at the future resiliency of land to support biodiversity in a change in climate. Really, really interesting, has eventually now is a part of grant applications, as I mentioned. Um, this is a really nice user-friendly data viewer, and I would really recommend it. I even have our, you know, I always recommend it to our project managers who use GIS because the, you can download data from their website, um, and you can do it from this site as well. From There's a way to do it here, but it's a lot of data. It's a lot of information. I encourage you to do that as well, but it can be a lot to get through, and so this is just a much more user-friendly way um, the core data set you want to look at is this resilient sites and you can, if you have a question, you can click a link and you can see a description and they give you a, you know, a legend down here in the bottom that tells you what is or is not resilient. Um, and then the real thing that I wanted to show you that's super helpful is you can upload a shapefile of a project and it will calculate the resiliency of that project. We do this at Greenbelt, um, even though we have a lot of GIS capacity because it calculates information really quickly and it creates a nice report that you can download as a PDF and you can attach to a grant application. So I'm gonna click this upload zipped shape and I have one that I've prepared here. So this is a parcel that we acquired um, in 2021 it's part of a larger property, the 95 acre property that we acquired. Um, and this is a public property of ours. Um, this does take like a minute-ish to run. If you click okay, you might feel like it's not doing anything, but try to be just patient and let it run. Um, what it does, because it's very difficult, you can see this data is raster data, it's just squares. So it's a little trickier than like Biomap to calculate how much is within a parcel or a project area. And so if you can get a zip shape file, this is a really handy tool to use and it does generate this report, um, hopefully in the next like 30 seconds. So we don't all have to sit here and wait for it. Um, one thing that is nice about this tool is you can continue to use it as it's running. Um, you can look around, this is this parcel that we're looking at. Um, oh, there's the report, but you can even change the, the data layers. So this report is really interesting. It gives you kind of a, um, you know, a, a summary of the information. It gives you kind of sub data layers that go into their um, analysis. Um, it says here, you know, different categories and how many acres. So resilience flow and recognized biodiversity, 25 acres, resilience and flow, zero, et cetera. And then it gives you the scores for each category. So for resilience, we are uh, above average, which is great. For local connectedness, we're slightly above average. And for landscape diversity, we are above average. Um, and then if I want to, I can print this and I can choose to save it as a PDF. And then I can just attach it in a grant application. So that's a really, really handy tool um, for you all to use. And this is just a great data viewer in general to play with and use. Okay, I'm gonna, oops, I just stopped sharing. I did not mean to click that. Let me reshare. I'm gonna move on because I just have a couple more things I wanna talk about before Laura jumps in and I don't wanna run out of time. Okay, can you all, can you see the, um, the presentation again? Yes. Great. Okay, so I'm gonna run through these quickly because I think I've talked a little bit longer than I should have. So um, jumping now a little bit more into the prioritization um, perspective of GIS analysis. So this is looking at parcels and comparing parcel to parcel and looking at a number of data sources and combining them. 
So kind of big picture strengths of that approach, and I'm gonna show you a prioritization tool. Um, but one of the real strengths is that you can combine multiple data sources because you know, what I think a lot of people find is you're looking at a parcel or a property and you've looked at, let's say, habitat and it has some biomap and it has, you know, a certified rental pool and it has, you know, this or that. But you're comparing it against another project and how do you compare those two different parcels? Sometimes it's really obvious, but sometimes it's really not. And so that's kind of a key strength of a prioritization is it gives you a score or a category and it allows you to compare parcel to parcel across a geographic area. Um, it combines those data sources. That's kind of the first two bullets there. It really does, we have found in our prioritization efforts, strengthen our grant proposals. I'm gonna give a quick example about that. We have used prioritization to target landowner outreach. So if we, for example, have identified that parcels are really high or critical priority for agriculture, we will maybe send out um, you know, a mailing around funding or you know, whatever about farm landowners, and we can really focus it on those parcels. Um, some of the challenges, there's always challenges with data. Um, this is some of these are true for all data, some are more focused on prioritizations, but data quality and data availability. Um, data is always old, and it, but it just depends on how old. Some data I won't use because it's too old. Um, if something's from 2005, I'm probably not going to use it, um, depending on what it is. Um, scale, I mentioned that before, but some data is just not appropriate to use at a parcel level. Um, one thing we really find is it's very hard to capture local knowledge. So we have projects that we do, and we don't do a lot of them, but we do have them that do not show up in any prioritization analysis. They do not have a single data layer that maps and anything I've talked about today. And yet they're critically important to a community or a neighborhood or whatever, for whatever reason. And we still value that. And so that's just one trick is that it can be hard to capture that. Um, particularly with prioritizations, we, it's very important to us that we use the best and most recent science. And so we try not to develop, we develop our own scoring methods, but we're always trying to base them on existing scientific research. Sometimes we had a hard time in our projects finding good research that um, kind of could be used to extrapolate information to prioritization. So that can be tricky. And then, you know, when we're looking at land conservation, it can be really difficult to think about like particularly development risk. And then other things you can't predict at all, like landowner readiness and I, local priorities kind of gets to that local knowledge. Some data layers are starting to look at that, like that farms at risk data, that's new. Um, so that's gonna be interesting to use, but it can be really challenging to incorporate some of those information. Okay, so one more demo, and then I'm gonna do a couple more quick things. This is MassMapper, this is a prioritization tool. Um, you will know Mass Audubon Mapper, this is confusing. The state's Mass GIS data viewer is called Mapper, and Mass Audubon's prioritization tool is called Mapper. They are spelled differently. Very confusing. I wish their names were a little bit more different, but they're not. This is a really, really powerful tool, though, for um, anybody interested in land conservation to use. You can. I'm going to show you all, but you can create kind of a live prioritization of a geographic area. So let's just get right into it. Okay, so I'm going to assume that this worked because it has the last couple of times I've switched tabs. This is what that link takes you to. And this is kind of the, the um, main page around this project. And what this allows you to do, for, you can look at the instructions and it kind of gives you a step by step what you want to do. Um, it has examples. It also has a study area and this is really cool. So you can choose this based on a town, a county, a watershed, and the newer options are the multi-town land trust and the Mass DFW district. So um, I was actually excited to see that Greenbelt is an option. We are a county-wide land trust, so we can use the county option. But there's even, you know, there's quite a few land trusts in here, and maybe yours is in here. And it's really cool that they've added those as options. Today, just for purposes of speeds, um, I'm going to run it on a town um, perspective. So I'm going to run this for, let's see, I'm just going to randomly choose something, Hanson. So then it gives you lots of options of, you know, different things that you can do. It gives you info. 
One thing I found, and I've tried this on data viewers, different, um, I'm sorry, internet browsers, is for some reason these pop-ups are really, they're like transparent and they're really hard to see, but you can kind of make them out. Um, there is a report on this, so you can kind of dive into the report to get more information. But, you know, I wish we had the time to run all these, but we don't. Like the MassGIS mapping um, tool, same thing, play with this. Open it up, choose different options, and just mess around with it. Um, I'm gonna do the resilience model today. You're gonna notice that this still has Biomap 2. I'm not super surprised by that because the new Biomap was just released. So we'll have to wait until that's updated. Um, but there's other things you can see. There's some of that farmland and drinking water data, prime farmland. This is key drinking water, well head protection and surface water protection zones, et cetera. Um, so you have a lot of options there. And you know because we're doing a resilience model, um, you can kind of, this section here, I'm gonna say, okay, I, this is where you can customize it. Sorry, I should have said that. You can set these pre-calculated modes. So that's biological, aquatic, resilience, and balanced. And then you can customize them and you can get in here. I'm gonna just run one of these preset modes today. Um, you can further refine it by, you can say, I believe five acres is the standard parcel size. Um, but you can set a size threshold. So you could say, I only want parcels that are 50 acres or 10 acres, et cetera. Um, I'm gonna leave that standard. I can change my background. You can see the map. I can say, uh, do I want it a satellite? Do I want it a street map? And then these are different controls you can use to customize. Um, I'm gonna kind of just leave all the standard because it's so powerful just with this presets. It's, I mean, cool enough. And I'm gonna show you. So I run the model and here we have the um, resilience model for Hansen. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't a great example here, but you can see we have ones and twos popping up. And if I click on them, it gives me the parcel data. This is a town owned parcel. Um, and it gives me, it has, it scores a one for TNC resilience and for Biomap 2 coastal adaptation, which is one of those sub data layers I mentioned that Biomap has, a zero. So maybe I work in Hanson and I say, okay, this isn't the most useful. I'm gonna run a balanced model. And I'm gonna just click that and run it again. Oh, suddenly we have some more interesting information. And I can click this and zoom in. I can look around. I can click a parcel and I can find out. For, so sometimes for some reason, um, a parcel doesn't give you results and I'm not entirely sure why that is. One possibility, and I could find out why, but or I could try to find out why, is that maybe there's no owner for that parcel. Um, but I don't run into it a lot. But I can see here, you know, why did this parcel score how it did? And so you can, you know, really play with this with the different settings and the different geographies um, and see what's useful for you. Now, importantly, you can export this as a CSV file. And so what that means is you actually get the table and you get the results and the landowners, and then you can use that. If you use GIS, you can import that into GIS, or if you don't, you can have a table and you can use that for whatever purpose you might want. Um, so that's a really, really powerful tool that Mass Audubon has developed. And it's great because it allows, you know, basically any land conservation organization within Massachusetts to run their own prioritizations. Okay, so I'm going to kind of jump ahead because again, I've gone over a little bit here. Um, this is our prioritization project. I'm not going to talk a lot about this. Um, we are currently updating this project. The link at the bottom is the link that takes you to a short write up and a very long technical document. If anybody's interested in this project, please contact me. I'm happy to talk to you about it. Um, we finished it in 2019. We did six analyses where we identified every parcel five acres and larger on all of these different criteria. It was very involved. We've probably spent two to three years. There's a lot of, I've done whole presentations on it, so I won't talk more about it, um, but you know, it is something that I have spent a lot of time on. And if you ever wanna kind of talk through this, I'm actually gonna be meeting with a land trust in the next week from Vermont about it. I'm always happy to meet with people or talk about it if you're interested. Um, but for the purposes of time, I just wanna jump into a quick project example. Because all this stuff, I do really enjoy the data, if I'm going to be honest, I should with my job. But when it comes into context is when it gets really interesting. And Laura's going to talk more about that in a moment. So I'm just going to give one quick project example, and then I will stop talking and hand it over to Laura. 
So this is a property that we acquired um, in the last few years in Linfield. Um, it was the number one priority for the Ipswich River Watershed Association. It is a key parcel in the headwaters of the Ipswich River. This was a collaborative project and where we are located, land is wildly expensive and I'll talk more about that. So many of our projects are, um, but this was a partnership between Ipswich River Watershed Association, Greenbelt and the town of Linfield. Um, and I'm giving this as an example because this is a great example of tying data to your mission and also tying it to kind of the success of projects. So this parcel, these are our results from that prioritization project I just mentioned. Um, this was a critical priority for drinking water, which we knew that. Um, it was, had been identified by the town as a critical priority for drinking water protection, but it also turned out to be a priority for inland flood mitigation, habitat, and what we call natural resilience, which is really just kind of habitat with a climate lens, okay? It also abuts, it has trails on it, that's the map in the bottom left-hand corner, and it abuts this huge 550-acre town-owned conservation land that has trails. And so by doing a really thorough data review and a prioritization, we were able to talk about this property, not only in terms of drinking water, which was really, really important, but also for all these other features. And so that really helped build the consensus around protecting this land, and it helps with grants and fundraising as well, because some people are interested in habitat, some people are interested in flooding, some people are interested in drinking water. And so it really kind of broadened the base of support for this parcel. Now, if you dive into the data for these different kind of um, areas, you know, it turns out that this property is mapped as important in CAPS, the Conservation Assessment Prioritization System from Amherst. It has all sorts of drinking water areas mapped under it. You know, it has some bio map, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're just doing those parcel reviews of a property, you know, the, the data still is consistent. It's just with a prioritization, you can be a little more succinct. And then that ties to funding. And that's one reason why all of this review is so important, not only to get to know parcels, but also to, to fund it. So this is a really expensive property. Land is in our region, $2.7 million. And we used our prioritization analysis in an MVP, that's the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program, funding for climate resilience for municipalities. We use that prioritization data in the towns. We helped them with their application and we received a one, they received a $1.6 million grant for acquiring this property. It certainly also helped that this parcel had been identified in this town's MVP plan as a priority for drinking water. And we were able to say, yes, it's a critical priority for drinking water. Um, we also successfully fundraised $300,000 and we're able to make that case under drinking water and other criteria. Okay, so I'm gonna finally stop talking and I'm gonna hand this over to Laura and I'm sorry that I went on a bit long, but thank you all for your attention. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So um, I can't see you either for some reason, I'm not sure why. Uh, this was kind of a pause slide. <laughs> And I'm just going to go ahead with, with my slides. Uh, yes, that was a ton of great information from Abby. It's a lot to absorb. So I'm sure you'll have fun um, uh, looking at those viewers that she presented. And I can't um, do the slide. So Abby, if you could go to the next one. So I just wanted to show you another prioritization example. Sudbury Valley trustees had done a prioritization originally in 2014, uh, nine years ago. Um, and we looked primarily at that time at habitat and farmland. We decided last year to completely redo the prioritization. Uh, a couple of changes were made, not only did we not just do it ourselves, but we spoke to all of our communities in the Metro West Conservation Alliance in our, our service region to get their input on what they wanted to see in this. So on the right, you can see we did again, habitat for biodiversity and farmland, but what we also created was 
community conservation, there's a lot of emphasis in that one on environmental justice area and on access and trail connections. And then you can see in the lower left, natural services was another uh, featured uh, data set. We have data viewers for each of these. And for natural services, that has a lot to do with um, climate resilience and municipal vulnerability preparedness. Uh, in fact, all of them, except for the farmland, look at climate factors. Uh, but so this is a, a much richer uh, selection that folks in, at least in our region can use to evaluate uh, land protection. So I just wanted to show that to you and you can find this on SVT's website. Next slide. So I thought it would be helpful to show you the project evaluation matrix that Sudbury Valley trustees uses. This is actually something that sits in our prop, in our database, our project database. So we we actually do use this regularly. And there's three packages, I guess I'll call them. One is ecological, another's community, and another's stewardship. So with the ecological, we look at size, bigger's better. We look at rare species and or rare nat natural communities. Um, is a parcel contiguous with other existing conservation land or large undeveloped land that has potential for uh, protection? So these are all things that would uh, make it a better ecological um, property. For natural community integrity, uh, is it a is it a, a nice quality type of forest or wetland? Uh, water resources protection, are there streams, uh, ponds, waterways, that sort of thing? And then some of those other uh, layers that Abby was talking about earlier, biomap, IVA, et cetera. And we give these an overall ecological summary that will kind of write a summary. But we have also done a ranking of high, medium, low. We try to stay away from making it very quantitative, but it kind of helps us size up those features. And this is based on a combination of the mapped resources. And then when we visit the site, it, it's um, kind of finalized. So if you go to the next slide. So then the next grouping is community value. So looking at agriculture, is it in agriculture or does it have prime farmland soils? Scenic is, is really important for our uh, communities. So that's one of the factors. Again, looking at public water supply, are there historic values to the property, recreational values? So we look at those. And then the final one, you go to the next slide is stewardship needs and challenges uh, based on historical and current land use, uh, surrounding land use, uh, those will impact. So for example, if you have a, let's say a 20 acre parcel and it's surrounded by um, corporate office buildings or residences, you know, that could be more challenging to manage than if it's in, you know, near other woodlands. Uh, are there structures on the property that could be a safety hazard that you have to manage or that you have to pay to remove? Uh, what is, what's the trail situation and how might you consider existing or potential access and how to manage it? What are the habitat types and thinking about their management needs? Uh, are there invasive species, which there unfortunately often are, and how might that influence stewardship? And then finally, uh, if there's encroachments or potential encroachments. So those are all what those, those three go into our matrix. And we actually do a printout from those three for our board memos. So then preparing for the site visit, um, you wanna do your homework, look at the, the current deed, look at the easements, look at the maps, the survey plans, the aerial photos. So what you're doing here is you're kind of doing a, a pre-site visit. So you know what you're looking for when you're out there. You think what you want to look at more specifically when you're going out to the property. You would have done a lot of the review that Abby reviewed earlier in this presentation. 
And you want to think about who do you want on that site visit. So for example, here at SVT, we've gotten much more into the habit of pretty early on in project review, both a land protection and a stewardship person will visit the property at the same time if possible. And of course, you have to get landowner permission. The next slide. So then at the site visit, uh, it's really important to try to check the boundaries if, if you can. If it's in the middle of a swampy wetland, you might not be able to do that. Uh, you do want to look and see if they're monumented. Are they well marked or not? Are you going to be able to do the baseline documentation? Do you need to get a survey in order to get them monumented? Are there any encroachments or potential encroachments? And what about residential proximity? So what do I mean by that? Is we have found that if a yard and a house, you know, if an active residential area goes right up to a boundary line, we tend to have more issues and more costs because then it might be more likely that the person is gonna be dumping their yard waste on your conserved land or they're going to be calling you and saying, oh, your tree fell down on my house, or it's about to fall down on my house. So that, that makes a really huge difference when we're ex estimating stewardship costs. So moving on from that, again, what are the habitat types? So even if you're not a really strong biologist or ecologist, you know, do the best you can. Like, is there forest? Is there field? Are there wetlands? Um, think about what kind of management those might require and start to develop a, you know, a sense and description of the property. Uh, are there any safety concerns? Like we've had a couple of properties with um, open wells uh, that, you know, you'll need to cover them up or there may be other concerns. Invasive plants, I keep talking about that, they're a problem, but you may decide you're not going to deal with them and, and that could be a good decision as well. Uh, remember to take photos. And when you're taking photos, those are photos that you're going to use to help make a case to your board or to, to for grant applications and to document uh, management issues and, and to help you uh, remember what was on the property. Um, and then through all of that, you can think about costs of stewardship. So if you go to the next slide, so I wanted to share a few examples to kind of just get you thinking about what it's like when, when you're doing this and to stimulate some questions and conversation after I finish the presentation. Um, so in this example, we were being gifted a 44 acre property that was beautiful woodlands, but it was surrounding a condominium development. And in many cases, I would be like, mm, I don't know about that. Because when you get conservation land that's been uh, basically fragmented and broken up by a, a big development in the middle, as you know, you're fragmenting the habitat, you're ruining a bunch of the habitat right in the middle. Uh, but in this case, I have to say it was gorgeous woodlands, uh, really nice diversity, and and we're hopeful that we're gonna be able to protect some of the adjoining lands as well. Uh, and it also connects in the town to some other trails and conservation land. So when we went out to the site to check before we uh, like said, yes, we're gonna accept it. We went and checked out the site and we looked at um, the proposed boundaries. And on the left, you can see that we found this massive amount of rocks because the developer decided he was gonna get rid of all the rocks he was excavating, but boulders, and throw them over here. Well, it just so happened that those were in the land that they said they were gonna be giving us. And I said, no, we really don't want that. So, <laughs> so they changed the boundaries, which they didn't like, but they did it. So this is again, really important to get out on those sites before you make those final decisions. If you go to the next slide. So this is pretty standard uh, in Massachusetts, New England, you know, an old farm dump. You see a pile of stuff, you see some old metal trinkets sticking up or some bottles. Uh, it could be innocuous, but it could be a potential problem. You'd need to think about whether or not you need to do a phase one environmental assessment for hazardous waste. Uh, it could also be a safety issue. 
Um, so that might be something you'd find. If you go to the next slide, you'll see here, uh, this was a CR that we were working on with a town. Um, and this is, again, pretty common because if you have a fairly sizable tract of land, let's say 35 acres. I know it's not big for some of you people out west, but for us, that's a pretty good size piece of land. Um, you know, you, you know, neighbors don't always know where their boundaries are. And this person had a garden and a lawn on part of this property. And it took a while to resolve that before we could finalize uh, the CR. Uh, so again, it's really important to do this. And if you go to the next slide, um, so again, now this, this actually happened after we acquired the CR, but I, I put it in here because it could just as easily have happened before the deal was done. Because again, this person didn't know where their boundary was. Most of the time it's not malicious. Um, and they started cutting down vegetation in, in the conserved land. And we actually were able to work very well with this abutter. But again, just an example of what you might find on a site visit. So if you go to the next slide. Um, so in summary, reviewing the GIS data allows you to get to know a property and really helps you make those connections to your mission, which is what you're looking for or not. You just decide not to do the project because that is always a potential. Uh, conservation prioritization really helped you connect strate strategic goals to planning decisions. Uh, these are tools to support project managers, grant applications, and direct organizational resources. Uh, and another thing that was important that Abby pointed out earlier was local knowledge. So you're not always going to find all the information in those GIS layers. So you, you need to get your head out of the computer sometimes and look up around you. Uh, and then finally, those site visits really fill out the picture and add important on the ground information, unintended, for a final decision and, and negotiation. And we are now open for questions. And Abby, I don't know if you want to stop sharing so that we can see. Sure. Let's see, I think that works because you can change your view yep. to gallery, and then people can feel free to turn them their videos on if they want us to see their faces or not. And so thanks, Abby and Laura, for a um, very in-depth uh, program. We had two questions. Um, we referred them elsewhere, but um, they both dealt with where on um, Biomap and Mapper where the data was pulled from, um, but basically we referred them to Biomap because that's probably a more in-depth question than you'd like to answer. But if you have a short answer. Yeah, it's a long project, collaborative project between Nature Conservancy um, and the state, as I mentioned, they do have great resources. There's a combination of data sources that go into Biomap. There is some field work that is done, um, as well as um, the, some of the other data sources I mentioned are fed into it. So I believe they use the, some of the critical link linkages data that was developed by UMass Amherst. Um, they certainly use uh, estimated and priority habitat. So it's a wide variety of kind of key data sources. Um, but yeah, you know, the resources that Rob and Barbara sent, I'm sure they have so many story maps. It's really wonderful. And there's a lot of great data and information there. Um, any other questions? I just want to, I just want to kind of, um, it's kind of a question. It's kind of a comment, but I, I was struck in listening to both your presentations that there's kind of a couple of different ways to think about this topic of prioritization, and and I think in in some ways the way that you presented reflects a couple of different um, situations that organizations and municipalities are faced with. One is stepping back and looking at the whole service region, you know it can be overwhelming. You know, what are our priorities? What should we focus on? 
Um, for that, that's maybe where you start to really do this mapping analysis and think about how different mapping tools can help you answer that question. Um, on the other hand, um, sometimes you're looking at a specific opportunity. So because often we're in the situation where there's a specific opportunity to react to. Maybe it's a chapter 61 withdrawal and we have a limited amount of time to decide if we want to act on it. And you want to sort of look at the parcel and say, well, is this an important parcel? But you don't have the luxury of sort of doing a town-wide analysis or a region-wide analysis. Instead, you're saying, well, I'm looking at this property and how important is it? You know, and those are kind of two different use cases. And I just kind of wanted to acknowledge that. There, there's also, um, you know, I think, Laura, you, Laura, you took us a little further down that path, is you have a specific property and how are you going to think about the stewardship obligations and how does that factor into... So it just, you know, it just struck me that there's a couple of different ways um, to come at this very big question of how do you prioritize? Yeah, I think um, it, I find it odd on Zoom because I can't see anybody's faces. Like, are people falling asleep or are they interested? <laughs> but We're here. Hi, Jane. Thank you. Um, but, you know, one of the things I'm wondering, like, I guess for people who are newer to this, you know, when now that the, all of this information has been thrown at you, has it changed how you think you might prioritize projects in your community or your service area? What, what criteria are you thinking about now that you didn't think about before? Um, if you'd like to share. I think the uh -huh. matrix is going to be super helpful to manage even just the single CR process. Okay, great. Um, I actually think that it, I'm thinking about we've prioritized a lot of properties already, and we have some that are maybe now actively getting into the hopper. Um, and so looking at these tools and thinking about um, how can I use them to communicate and articulate our message? You know, what what tools can I put together to sort of explain, you know, the importance and why the why these parcels are priorities? And it's also making me think more about um, the funding side of things. And now I have a much better understanding of where to find the information um, mm -hmm. that will be needed, you know, to think about applications. So this is really helpful. Yeah. I want to speak to Julie's comment about all the info increases, the decision making burden. Um, I think that um, it can be overwhelming at first. Um, I think you might want to decide for your organization, like what's what are your top priorities? Uh, that's that's one way to kind of help you not look at everything at once. And the other thing I can tell you is that when you get looked, you accustomed to looking at some of these data viewers, like let's just say you decide, I'm just going to go to Mass Audubon's mapper and use that. Um, once you get to know it, it becomes less overwhelming, you know, as you, if you do what Abby said and just get to know them, um, it becomes less overwhelming and, and feeling like such a decision making burden. So two comments on that. Rita, yeah, you had a I, question? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say that um, the new biomap is very exciting, especially for local landscapes. And now I think the challenge is being able to leverage that to bring about the kind of zoning bylaw that are needed to, uh, I'm speaking as a member of an all volunteer land trust that's you know, just working in one community. Um, it's, it's a little challenging because it's like you have the data, but um, you know, my nature doesn't care about the assessor lines or who owns the property. And now how do you move forward and how can you leverage the biomap? So um, I think that's one of the big challenges that we're having right now especially with prioritization, depending on who owns the land. That's a really great point, Rita. And you know, I, one of the things that we've done is worked with um, 
towns open space committees to work priorities into their open space plan because if a parcel is identified in the open space plan it helps qualify them again for funding right in state grant applications so that can be a key way to kind of help use this data and to inform it you can look at those parcels that have the local or other biomap data sources and they can go into a town's open space plan or a land trust you know conservation plan, kind of strategic or prioritization plan. And I think that it is, you, you know, to frame this, as I think Rob was getting at, there's proactive and there's reactive, right? And we use all of these tools and information in both ways. So every project that comes through our door and most of them are reactive, right? Something happens. It might be that we've been talking to a landowner for 20 years and suddenly they hear about a friend of theirs got sick and they're like, wait a minute, I need to figure this out. Or can be any number of things, right? Somebody gets given a gift of land, something happens. And we, for every project that comes to our doors, we review every single one of those data sources that I talk about. We're a regional land trust, we have 20 staff, we are able to do that. So it really depends on your size and scale, as Laura mentioned, that maybe you're really focused on habitat and you can really kind of drill down on that. Maybe you're really focused on one neighborhood or environmental justice communities. But we're using those data to review each project that comes through the door and to use that information to develop our message how we tell the story of this project, how are we going to fund it, which uh, grant applications is it most likely to be kind of successful with both from a state and a foundation grant perspective. Um, and then also we take all, we have chosen to do the prioritization route, which you can do or not do. And we use that both in a proactive way, kind of some of the examples I gave before and a reactive way, so. Do you have any, uh, recommendations. I mean, everything that you said is just totally right on and, and it's been very effective in working with private landowners and ag res properties. Um, I think a challenge is for properties that have been lying undeveloped, but they're corporately owned and all of a sudden a new horse charges in into the gate and the goal is let's cut every tree and develop every part of the parcel we can. And, and you look at the new Biomath 3 and go, oh my God. So I, I think it's the whole strategy of how is a little all volunteer land trust, do you work with corporate landowners whose goal is the bottom line and responding to the market? And um, I don't know, recession's great for, conserving land, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, that's the biggest challenge is how do you, I mean, so far the, like the core habitat and, and aquifers, stuff like that, that has um, regulatory power is good, but it's, um, I don't know. <laughs> so Laura may have more she wants to add to this, but I would say really kind of putting all the pieces in place as much as you can ahead of time. So building what I, you know, I'll often call the open space infrastructure. So does the community have an open space committee? Yes, um, do they no. have, right, like for, so for whatever it is, do they have CPA? Is that something that yes. can get passed for funding, right? Yep. Um, do they have an open space plan that's approved by the state? If they don't, they're not eligible for state funding, right? So all of these pieces are really important to get. And then, you know, doing the best you can to build the relationships with municipal staff if you're a land trust so that you have those relationships and they know that you're a resource. If you have a regional land trust, we work with local land trusts all the time and they will bring projects to us or we will do them in partnership or we'll just give them assistance. So we, that's the thing Greenbelt does. I think it is a thing that other state and regional land trusts do. Mass land is obviously another resource. Um, and then I, you know, I hate to say this, but unfortunately, sometimes we can't save everything. And it's easier when you're looking at a regional perspective, but sometimes Greenbelt has done all of those things. We've been working on a project for 20 years sometimes, and it gets developed. It doesn't happen a lot, and we really try to work to prevent it, but it does happen sometimes. Or sometimes, actually more commonly, it gets partially developed, and it's not what we would have chosen, but it's the best we can do. So... You know, ultimately, as land trusts, we do work with kind of willing sellers, right? So, you know, and it is a free market where certain people will choose other options than conservation. 
Yeah, but I think it's very powerful to think about compiling your data about a parcel so you can educate the landowner about what's special about their property because they may not know it. I have one example and it's maybe not I, the best example because it was a nonprofit corporation rather than a for-profit corporation, but they were gonna build their headquarters building in an area that the Nature Conservancy had prioritized as um, regionally significant. And they actually bought a different, they got a different piece of land. They moved their planned headquarters building to a different parcel after we educated them about what was special about the or their original site. So, um, you know, once in a while people will will uh, respond to education because they, they're not automatically going to know all these, they're not going to know um, about the TNC's resilient mapping layer or what Mass Audubon's mapper can tell them, you know, that's that's what we do is we learn about those things so we can talk to landowners about it. Any further questions or comments? We're heading down towards the half hour. So anyone else? I, I have well, a, oh, did anybody else want to say something? Because I, I just wondered if Laura or, or Abby have an example of how you use all these tools and then decide not to do something. Because sometimes uh, we're guilty of never meeting a piece of open space we don't like. <laughs> you know, I mean, sometimes we're accused of that anyway. So can, can you talk a little bit about using some of these tools and then saying this is one we shouldn't do? I mean, you know, I'm curious about that. Um, usually the ones we say no to, it's based on small size and surrounded by too many houses, <laughs> you know, just really isolated. But I would say, um, you know, if, if it's a parcel that doesn't have like some outstanding community value and, um, there's no biomap, there's no priority habitat, there's no connecting corridors, you know, then we'll, you know, we could say, I'm sorry, but I, I'm not thinking of specific examples per se right now, but that's kind of the way we typically said no. Um, yeah. We've done the same thing. And I would say, um, like, we have kind of similar examples. I would also say that for conservation restrictions, particularly, that's like a forever burden. They're all forever burdens, but particularly conservation restrictions. So if something's really small and disconnected and it really doesn't have conservation value, we're probably not going to do it no matter what. But the kind of the burden for a conservation restriction is going to even be higher. Um, the other thing we do, and you have to be very careful with this and know that you know what you're doing, but if something's way overpriced, we will not do it. You really shouldn't. As a nonprofit, you have to kind of be, you don't want to be uh, profiting the landowner and overpaying. And even within wiggle room, if we could justify it and we still don't think it's like appropriate and we know the market won't go for it, that's a key thing in knowing your, the market in your area, we will sometimes wait and we'll play the long game and we will know that something is not gonna sell. And again, our numbers are huge, right? This thing is just not gonna sell for $2 million because it is, we were just talking about one the other day, it is not developable, it is not accessible. Right, it's a risk though. If it gets combined with another parcel, maybe it suddenly becomes developable. But knowing kind of the market, so sometimes we'll kind of just let the landowner learn the reality of the market, and that has actually worked for us before. Sometimes playing the long game is really it's it's emotionally hard sometimes when you get attached to land, but it's really helpful because sometimes we've done that and the projects come back to us throughout the years, and we always stay open and friendly and approachable with the landowner. We do not make enemies with landowners unless for some crazy thing happens because we have had situations where somebody's gone through 10 years of permitting and rigmarole and the abutters fight it and it comes back to us because there's a recession or whatever. We have one in Rockport, 47 acres. It was supposed to be like 52 houses and we protected it with the town, just one example. So. We say no sometimes, but we also play the long game if we're really confident about it. But again, I'm just going to say you have to be careful about that because it cannot work out for you. 